Well, good day, folks. My name is Holger Neubauer, and I'm the preacher of the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. And today I want to continue my second installment as I review Brother Kyle Butt and his video set forward by Apologetics Press on the second coming of Christ. Kyle is a representative of Apologetics Press, a parachurch organization devoted to the defense of Christian doctrine, defense of the inspiration of the Bible, debating for the existence of God, objective morality, and much of what they stand for I appreciate. And yet Kyle, as he spoke of the second coming of Christ and pushed the second coming of Christ out into the yonder, into the future, he rested or took all of the scriptures that he used, every single one, out of their proper context. Last time I reviewed particularly Matthew 24 and verse 36, but of that day and that hour knows not one. Kyle, first of all, rejected the immediate context of Matthew 24 and verse 36. Because in Matthew 24, verse 8, where Jesus said these are the beginning of the sorrows, Jesus used the Greek word odin, which refers to birth pangs. And in birth pangs, of course, a woman has these great pangs announcing the birth of the child, which are stronger and closer together right before the birth of the child. And so, obviously, a woman does not know the day and the hour of the birth of the child, but she certainly knows the general time frame. And the 40 weeks of a woman's gestation period is not an arbitrary time. It's God ordained, which represents the 40 years of Israel's birth pangs until the time of the new reality. And so that's the immediate context. And yet, Kyle was unaware of the remote context that Jesus was actually quoting from Zechariah 14.7, a day known to the Lord. And in that particular context, it's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And so we demonstrated that Kyle misused Matthew 24 verse 36, that there is not a division in the Olivet Discourse, that Jesus uses the singular word parousia on both sides of the alleged divide in Matthew 24, 27, as the east flashes uh, unto the west, as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. And the word parousia means presence. Kyle would agree here. And yet the same Greek word is used in Matthew 24, 37 on the other side of the alleged divide. As the days of Noah were, so it shall be as the, in the coming of the Son of Man. It's the Greek word parousia, singular. There's one parousia. And the end of the age, which was the third part of the question that the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 3, is addressed in the first part of Matthew 24. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. What end? The end of the age. This gospel will be preached as a witness to all the world, and then the end will come. What end? The end of the age that they ask about. And so we can see, for someone who just would look at the text in a more critical way, that in fact the Olivet Discourse is not divided. Now Kyle also misused Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, which is very commonly misused in Churches of Christ. What happens among us has happened among the denominations. You have a few preachers who say this is what this text means, and the other preachers hear that, and they repeat what was said about this particular text. Just like Ezekiel chapter 12, 21 through 28, there was a proverb in Israel. And this lie was repeated so often and so strongly that it became believed by the majority. And the false prophet said, the days are for many days, or the vision is for many days, and every vision fails. But the prophet said, no, the days are at hand. And at hand means near, and many days means far off. And the false prophet said, at hand could mean afar off. And the same kind of proverbs are now believed in churches of Christ. But we are uprooting this false doctrine. There are at least 80 preachers in India that I've had first-hand teaching in that are not teaching fulfillment. The Philippines now have preachers preaching fulfillment. Give us 40 years and we will root out this nonsense of a future miracle which the Bible teaches is just not so. 
So the text, now I want to review, that uh, Kyle misused in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. And I can just hear gospel preachers saying now, when the two men in white apparel told the apostles, the men from Galilee, this same Jesus, whom you see has been taken up from you, will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven, they will repeat these words. He left visibly, he left bodily, and he will return visibly, and he will return bodily. Anyone heard that before? Anyone heard a preacher use this kind of phrase? It's repeated thousands and thousands and thousands of times, this hackneyed retort, which is completely false. It is a rejection of the immediate context of Acts 1.11. All they needed to do is go back two verses to verse 9, and they would see that that was a fanciful interpretation. But suppose we only had verse 11. Acts chapter 1 stood alone without the context of verses 9 and 10. Let's consider this phrase, coming back in like manner. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Jesus was to refer, return in flaming fire. Now here's a question. Did Jesus leave and ascend in flaming fire? Well, don't think so. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52, the Bible says it would be like an instant, the twinkling of an eye. Did he leave in an instance in the twinkling of an eye? Don't think so. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, there is a trump that announces the coming of Christ. Was there a trump that announces his ascension? Don't think so. In Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 15, we find Jesus now there depicted on a white horse. And of course, it's a figurative passage. But now we want to ask ourselves the question, is it exactly the same manner? Why the white horse? Why the sword coming out of his mouth? Why the many crowns? You see, in like manner cannot mean exact same manner. There's a man I debated a few years ago who made that argument. Exact same manner, he said, exact same manner, except I pointed out the fact that Jesus was returning with flaming fire. He didn't have an answer, and he, of course he cannot answer. The truth of the matter is that there's a context that we need to pay strict attention to, and we're going to begin in verse 9 of Acts chapter 1. Now notice Luke's word as he records. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, this is significant. It is essential to our understanding of what's going on in the text. The cloud takes up Jesus from their sight. The cloud, as used in Scripture, is for the purpose of shrouding whatever's in its cloud. We find in 1 Kings chapter 8, in verse 11 and 12, where we find the temple was first constructed, that the cloud filled the temple with the glory of the Lord. Now, God's presence filled the temple upon its completion. And yet the Bible says no one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten in his bosom in bosom, he has declared him, John 1, verse 18. Now, no one saw God. His presence was shrouded by the cloud. This cloud is going to shroud the presence of Jesus. And so they'll know he is there, but they won't be able to see him. This point is further proven, and it is manifesting itself in the passage found in Isaiah 44 and verse 22. Here the Bible says, I will blot out your sins like a thick cloud. Now, if God's going to blot out someone's sins like a thick cloud, he won't be able to see them. But, however, he acknowledged that they were there. That's the idea. You put these ideas together and you see that the cloud shrouds whatever is being uh, spoken about in this cloud. And so we find that the cloud is often used in judgment language. In Isaiah 19 and verse 1, the Bible says that there was a burden 
that the prophet of Isaiah had upon Egypt. And the Lord rides on a swift cloud. And in this swift cloud, the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. And yet, we read from Isaiah 21 through 5 that the Assyrian king was sending Sargon, his uh, military general, and they went into Egypt. And in Isaiah 20 and verse 5, we find that Egypt and Ethiopia were taken away, bare their buttocks, were uh, shown, and they were naked. And it was a shame for the people as they were taken off into captivity. And yet the Lord did it. He rode on a swift cloud. The cloud shrouds the presence of God. They don't see the Lord, but they know he's there. Why? Because the prophet announced this judgment would take place. Coming in the clouds is simply a picture of national judgment, and it shrouds God. You remember in Matthew 17, 5, the Lord spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I am well pleased. They didn't see the father. He's shrouded by the cloud. Again, the cloud always shrouds, and the cloud is used in cases of national judgment. Now watch, please. In Luke chapter 21, Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus had just announced that every stone would be dismantled. Not one stone would be standing upon another. Luke 21, 6, Jesus said in Luke 21, 27, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Now what's that context? Luke chapter 21, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem comes with armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in her midst depart. Let not those in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And Jesus clearly said in Luke 21, 32, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Again, another typical picture of judgment. It is Hebrew judgment language. When a nation is about to be judged, we find the Lord riding on a cloud. Isaiah 19, 1, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. It's not a picture of someone like Pecos Bill riding a whirlwind. This is nonsense. It is a Hebrew idiom of national judgment used 3,000 years ago. Now, in the Old Testament, there's not one instance of a Lord riding on a cloud in which there's some kind of physical appearance. In Ezekiel chapter 30, we find the day of dark clouds, the day is near, the day of the Gentiles would come, verses 5 through 7. Well, Babylon was coming, day of clouds, the Lord was bringing judgment, it was near. There's not one instance, not one instance of the Old Testament when the Lord brought judgment on a nation that he manifested himself in some physical way, especially as a six foot six man who everybody can see. So then why in the New Testament would it mean something different? Well, of course, it doesn't mean anything different. It's just that we are unaware of the Hebrew idioms. And in fact, we are unaware of the Hebrew idioms. We don't know the voices of the prophets as we should. For if we knew them, we would never believe in a future coming of Christ. He came in the clouds and power and great glory within that generation. Now, when Jesus says, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and power and great glory, he's citing Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Now, how do I know that he is citing Daniel 7, 13 and 14? Because, in fact, it is the only text in the Old Testament where there is a Son of Man coming on the clouds. So I know that Jesus is quoting from Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And so, when Jesus is speaking before the high priest in Matthew 26 and 64, and he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds at the right hand of power, he is citing Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Why? It's the only text in the Old Testament where there is a Son of Man coming on the clouds. But in Luke 21, 27, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in power and great glory, and he attaches the kingdom to this event. Luke 21, 31, when you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Where is he quoting from? He's quoting from Daniel 7, 13, and 14, because it's the only text in the Old Testament where there is a Son of Man coming in the clouds. And Jesus knows how to quote in context. 
So what is the context of Daniel 7, 13, and 14? Well, when I was in Bible college, I was trained to believe that this was the ascension, which was 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days. And so Wallace applied this to the ascension. The Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. Makes sense, right? No, not if you read the context. There is a judgment taking place. The court is seated. The books are opened, according to verse 10 of Daniel chapter 7. And there is a man speaking pompous things who is destroyed in a body called the body of a beast in this particular event. Verse 11. And we find that same entity spoken about in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Now, what is this all about? Well, there are four beasts. Of course, there is the beast of Babylon and the beast of the Medes and Persians and the beast of the Grecians and the beast of the Romans. In the time of the Romans, there comes a beast, not the Roman beast. Rome would give its power to this beast whose body was to be destroyed. And the other beasts were sustained for a times and a half to destroy the body of the beast. Now, let's hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 28, where the carcass is, there will be the eagles gathered together. Kyle believes this is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Well, thank you very much. He's right. But in Luke 17, 37, the Bible says, where the body is, there will be the eagles gathered together. You see, those are the same events. They're not different events. That is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. What body is he speaking about? He's speaking about the body of the old covenant people, the body of Moses, which finally comes to an end in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus places the kingdom at the fall of the temple, Luke 21, 31. And here we find the kingdom comes in judgment. Daniel 2, 44, the kingdom comes in that fourth world empire. But there is a land base that the Babylonian empire envelops, enveloped by the Medes and the Persians, enveloped by the Grecians, enveloped by the Romans. Once the kingdom of God, which was spiritual in nature, and the kingdom means the rule of God in the hearts of men, and that message was preached all over the ancient world of the Jewish diaspora, the end could come and the kingdom could be established upon the earth because the same land base was overcome, you see. That's the meaning of Daniel 2 and verse 44. But our friend Kyle has misused Acts 1, 11 because he did not pay attention to Acts 1, 9, and 10. Kyle did no critical examination of any of those texts. He cites a text. Each text has a context and a remote context, which he ignored. Now, I want to remind Kyle that I challenged him to a debate, to a two-night or a four-night oral debate. He can choose the venue. He can write the proposition. I will meet him. Now, he can say that we have no influence. He can say, who is this little preacher up in Michigan who's spouting off these things? He can say that. We've got 80 preachers now. From my efforts alone, not including the efforts of Don Preston and William Bell, who came way before me, so the gospel was teaching, uh, the gospel of fulfillment was being taught there before my efforts. But now Brent Bischel and Roy Runyon has taken my efforts over for the churches in India, and it's spreading like wildfire. And India has a, oh, about a billion people. The Philippines are having it. We have many, many preachers in the church of the United States of America who have accepted fulfillment. But many of them have not spoken publicly because they know the consequences when they do. If every preacher in the church who believed fulfillment would stand up and say, I believe that Jesus returned in AD 70, It'd be like the times of Spartacus. They couldn't stop us. But many are afraid because many preachers will lose their jobs. They'll be called a heretic. And the powers that be don't try to answer us. No, they try to bully us like Jason Jackson did at a lectureship in Mississippi at the South Haven Church down there. 
He said from the pulpit, you must not let anyone talk to one of these men. If they're in the congregation, don't let anyone speak to them. Kind of like a papal bull, right? Put down their uh, mallet, and they say, no one shall talk, no one will reason with these individuals. What a bunch of baloney. We're not afraid, and we're not ashamed. We've got more brethren coming on all the time. Let's talk a little bit about the body of Jesus, shall we? When Jesus was raised, there were nail scars in his hands and in his feet, gaping wound in his side. He had the exact same physical body when he died than when he was raised. And yet, in some sense, he's new. In Acts chapter 13, and verse 33, we find in his resurrection, Paul said, that Jesus was raised up. As was said in the second Psalm, this day I have begotten you. What? Acts 13.33, you ought to pay attention, Kyle. In resurrection, he was new, but his physical body wasn't new. It was the old physical body. He was new on the inside, not on the outside. Just like when someone obeys the gospel today. He's made new by the death and the burial and the resurrection. Place in the waters of baptism, you come up in newness of life. You're not new in your physical uh, extremities. You're new on the inside. God looks on the heart. God is not going to redeem us from our skin. He's redeeming us from our sin. And my spirit will go on. And I am completely redeemed today. The idea that we're going to have a physical, biological resurrection one day, like Jesus, if you think about it, is more like the night of the living dead than the glorious resurrection morning. Because if you were resurrected like Christ, you would have to be resurrected physically in the very same state in which you died. So if you died with a diabetic fisher, you'd have to be raised with a diabetic fisher, albeit a glorified diabetic fisher. If you were uh, buried when you were black, you'd have to be raised black. If you were buried white, you'd have to be raised white. Do you see how nonsensical this is? It's actually a racist doctrine. Jesus didn't come to redeem us from our skin, to make our skin new. No, 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 no. He made us new on the inside. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 in particular. Now, the Bible says the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, was made a life-giving spirit. When? In resurrection. You see, Jesus overcame death in Hades. We have missed the spiritual meaning of the death and burial and resurrection by emphasizing some future physical body resurrection, which the Bible doesn't teach. Oh no, I agree in a bodily resurrection. But it was a corporate resurrection at the time of the end. Not a biological resurrection, some miracle at the end of time. I deny that with all of my being. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 is notoriously misused because verse 9 is not taken into consideration. The cloud is germane to this discussion, and the cloud always, always shrouds what it's intended to shroud. And so in Matthew 24, 30, and 31, where we find, then they will see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. He will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, which Kyle says is the destruction of Jerusalem. He has to agree then that the resurrection took place in AD 70. Because the gathering together of the elect means resurrection. Because that's what it means in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1. Our coming and our gathering together to him. Someone ought to ask Kyle. Kyle, do you believe the gathering together of the elect in Matthew 24, 31 is the same gathering together of uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, where the coming and the gathering together, and here the coming and the gathering together? Ask him what he says. Two comings? Two gatherings? You see, the futurists, like Kyle, they have more comings in the post office. They have more bodies than a centipede. They have more kingdoms than the Game of Thrones. They got more ends than old MacDonald. Here and end, there and end, everywhere and end, end. There's one great end. And the end is in the first part, end of the age, in the first part of the Olivet Discourse. 
Kyle has missed it by a country mile. Now, I bear no ill will toward Kyle. Much of his work I appreciate. I do appreciate his efforts to refute agnosticism and atheism. Appreciate his efforts to defend the inspiration of the Bible. I can give him a hearty amen. But I cannot countenance or agree with someone who rips the scripture out of its context and not allow God to qualify or modify himself by himself. You know, we don't have much patience for the Baptists who misuse Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I was door knocking some time ago, and the gentleman came to the door and said, um, as, after I introduced myself and I asked him uh, where he went to church, I usually ask him uh, that question, where do you go to church? He said, the Lighthouse Baptist Church was down the road. And so I asked him, I said, well, you're a Baptist, so you believe in baptism? He said, oh, yes, I believe in baptism. I said, baptism by immersion? He said, yes, baptism by immersion. In water? He says, yes, in water. I said, now, were you saved before you were baptized or after? He said, well, we were saved before. I said, well, have you considered Acts 22, 16, arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? And he cited Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, provide grace for you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. And he shut the door on me. He didn't allow God to qualify his own word. You see, in Romans 9, 31 and 32, the Bible speaks about Israel who did not attain the law of righteousness because they sought it not by faith, but by the law of works. 2,000 years ago, Paul was comparing the covenant of works, which was the law of Moses, emphasizing meritorious deeds, and the new covenant, which emphasizes a working faith, that's for sure, but operated by grace. He didn't allow the scripture to interpret the scripture. That's exactly Kyle's problem. He hasn't allowed the scripture to interpret the scripture. Kyle, how about it? Two-night debate, four-night oral debate, you choose the venue. If you want, you can come to the Lakeshore Church building. We'll host you. There will be interest. I'd love to have a discussion with you where you can defend those six verses, which I suggest you used out of its proper context. So that's the lesson for today. I'm going to continue a few more installments. Remember, I'm Holger Neubauer, the preacher of the Lakeshore Church of Christ. You can contact me at 269-325-4449 if you'd like to talk to me. And remember Proverbs 4, verse 7, where wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all your getting. Get understanding. You guys have a good day.